first of all, I would like to thank the uh, Connecticut DOT for uh, granting uh, me permission to give this presentation on their bridge, and Midas for uh, inviting me to this uh, elite uh, speaker series, and of course to all the attendees for joining us. I'm going to be talking about the uh, transfer design of the uh, Q bridge. Real quickly, we're going to talk about where this project is located. It's located in the USA, in the state of Connecticut, and more closely in the city of New Haven. This project is the uh, interchange between I-95 and uh, Interstate I-91 and uh, Connecticut Route 34. Mm -hmm. And as James mentioned, the main span of the bridge goes over the, the Kinepec River, uh, therefore the name the Q Bridge. The owner of the, the bridge is the Connecticut Department of DOT, and uh, the, the old bridge was a steel plate girder bridge. You can see this is a view of the old bridge, which had uh, three lanes in each direction. This actually opened in January of 1958, and it was once the longest plate girder bridge in the Western Hemisphere. This bridge became functionally obsolete many years ago. It was designed for about 40,000 cars, and um, as of the date that the studies were made, probably about 15 years ago, 140,000 cars drove by I-95. The replacement bridge selected was an extra dose bridge. There were several studies made about um, different alternatives, including some composite steel, plate girder or box girders, casting plate segmentals, precast segmentals, and um, some even uh, small conventional cable stay bridge. Um, at the end, a um, extra dose bridge was selected. The the new bridge. Among many of the benefits that uh, carry are basically f expanding the uh, the width to five lanes in each direction, and uh, improved uh, travel lanes and wider shoulders, and uh, better lines of sight. We're going to talk a little bit about why the extra dose bridge was selected and here's a chart about what type of bridges are economical for certain spans and at the top we have the steel box and at the bottom we have the suspension bridge. The Q bridge is about 515 feet so it falls somewhere between um, a steel box that's at Mengtel and a um, cable stay right at the very edge at the very lower end of the span. Talking about a little bit about the extra load bridge, we're going to first start on what's a regular girder bridge. A, gir a regular girder bridge um, uses the stiffness of the girder to transfer the loads to the piers and in addition with ascensioning to aid with the stresses and with the flexure. A cable stay bridge is a lot slimmer and it uses the stays to help support the girder along the length of the bridge. In this case, the stays, the tower height is about maybe a quarter of the span. An extra dose bridge, the tower height is a lot shorter and the depth of the girder is somewhere between a girder bridge and a stay cable bridge. So in summary, an extra dose bridge, it's, it's a mixture between a cable stay bridge and a post tension girder bridge. It's somewhere in between. Uh, some of the features are that the tower height is shorter than the cable stay. The depth of the girder is somewhere between a girder bridge and a cable stay being deeper than the girder bridge and shallower than the cable stay. 
Another feature is that the, the cable state planes are flatter and they all have the same angle. And another one of the features is that since the girder depth is taller than a state cable bridge, there's an alternate load path not only through the cables but through the girders themselves. The state cables are sized also to contribute to the deck pre-stressing. Due to the shallower angle, there's more compression going into the deck. And the other feature is that the cable stays all have the same area because of the uniformity of the angles. Why was an extra dose bridge selected for the Q bridge? The number one reason is because it falls within the length range for extra dose bridge. And um, it also, one of the reasons was because we could have a longer span and uh, with that we avoided the existing bridge foundation because when you see later the uh, erection sequence, the old bridge had to be functioning. The other reason is because of the shallower girder, we had a lower profile and that's to allow for the uh, navigation channel underneath. Uh, the other reason was the shorter towers, uh, since we were close to the uh, airport, we needed some overclearance. And lastly, the aesthetics of the bridge uh, was selected, was one of the reasons why this was selected. The project description, this is the main span, is about 309 meters, a little bit over a thousand feet with the main span being 157 meters. You can see also an interesting point is the foundation. Uh, we had uh, drill shaft, about 58 drill shaft of two and a half meters diameter, ranging from 62 meters to 13 meters. Uh, on the Anchor Pier 1, those uh, drill shafts were the longest ones, about 200 feet. The North Pond Bridge was dedicated in 2012. After that, the existing bridge, the traffic was shifted into the North Pond Bridge, both North Pond and South Pond, while the bridge, the existing bridge was demolished and the new South Pond Bridge was constructed. And then eventually, the traffic was diverted to the North Pond and the South Pond structures. The total project of the total cost of the interchange was about two billion dollars, with the main span somewhere around six hundred million. The project staging was such that, of course, traffic had to be maintained on I-95, so the existing bridge carried the northbound and the southbound traffic. The northbound portion was constructed, then the northbound and southbound traffic was moved into the new bridge. The existing bridge was demolished and the southbound structure was built and then the traffic was shifted to the northbound and the southbound. The way that this bridge was built was using the balance cantilever erection. This is just a few slides of how the um, bridge was erected. First, you know, substructure, foundation, substructure, uh, pier tables, we had the uh, form travelers and then cast each side balancing and uh, st stressing the cables accordingly. At the end we continue until we close each of the end spans and then we close the main span and then we add the finishing touches, the barriers, the overlays, cleaning up and all that. The original design of the bridge was split into two, a longitudinal design and a transfer design. Uh, we started the design of this bridge in 2001 and we used uh, Bentley's RM bridge, which at that time was TDB's RM2000. For the uh, longitudinal design, we used a single spine model using beam elements and um, we modeled 
everything in, in this bridge, including the foundation, the drill shaft. There were some uh, issues with scouring, so we had to model different uh, length of the uh, drill shafts. Everything was included in this model, the strange stage construction, dead loads, post tensioning, creeping shrinkage, thermal loads, life loads. Next, we have a little bit of an um, erection sequence from the RM model. Basically, these are just some slides of the erection sequence. This includes the northbound and the southbound structures. Following are just some of the results that we sought from the uh, longitudinal design, the stresses, the stress summaries for the different load combinations. The transverse design was done independently with uh, using GT Strudel. Two models were actually um, used. One was a three-dimensional plate model where we did anything that had to do with dead loads, life loads, web shear distribution, and the addition effect from the cable stays. And since GT Strudel did not have the availability of use post tensioning on their plate models, we had to use several two-dimensional uh, frame models um, just to model the interior top slab post tensioning and the exterior drape post tensioning. Finally, we used several spreadsheets to merge the results from the 3D model and the 2D model. This is a view of the uh, GT Shuro plate model. Um, at that time, computing power wasn't as, as good as we have it now, so we limited the model to only one half of the main span on one side and the side span on another. In this case, this, the cable stays were modeled as springs. This is a quick view of the two-dimensional uh, frame model, and uh, this just shows some deformation due to the external PT loading. During the erection of the bridge, we found an opportunity to review the transfers assigned uh, with a new software that was available to us, which was Midas FEA. And uh, with the increased computing power, uh, we decided to create an as-built model using three-dimensional solids elements. Some of them are eight-node elements, some of them are six-node wedge elements. This model is a linear elastic model. So there's no reinforcement and there's no plasticity in the model. A creep and shrinkage with solids, uh, we didn't want to try to use it because creep and shrinkage in itself is, is very complicated. So we, model, we didn't model it implicitly. We did some approximations. Uh, in this Asbridge model, whatever the contractor had changed, we included, and um, everything is included in this model, the construction sequence, the superstructure, the substructure, the state cables, and the best thing was that we could include the longitudinal and transverse post tensioning with the solid elements. Developing the model was um, a challenge because the bridge has a, it's a multi-sail concrete box with a variable deck width along the length of the bridge, and it has a variable girded depth at the towers, and it has a variable bottom slab thickness at the towers as well. Here you can see some of the dimensions. Uh, the center cell has a constant width of seven meters, but the two outside cells uh, have a variable width. The bridge width went from 29.9 meters at the beginning of the bridge to 37.7 meters at the end of the bridge. Here we have a view of the variable depth. Uh, the, the depth buried somewhere along uh, three and a half meters to five meters at the towers. And we have the net, the other variation was the bottom slab thickness at the same locations of the greater depth variation. The bottom slab varied from 240 millimeters to 450 millimeters. So all that had to be incorporated into this solid uh, 
brick model. Uh, the total number of solid elements used was over 50,000. We use some plate elements for the diaphragms, and all those line elements include the state cables and the post tensioning, external and internal. This is a close up view of the bridge end. You can see the cross section, you can see the stays, and you can see the top, the, the top uh, transverse tendons, the external drape tendons, and the cantilever tendons, which we'll see a little bit more in detail. At the end, you can also see the diaphragm at the anchor pier. The cross sections were originally drawn in microstation uh, for the original design, so I decided to use the those uh, cross sections. Um, since the, the the bridge varies in width, depth, and bottom slab thickness, uh, I had to include every significant change. So there were 40 different cross sections uh, that represented the length of the bridge. Those cross sections were exported into DXF, and um, Midas FEA can import those cross sections via DXF as well. This is a, a view of the microstation cross sections, and you have to be careful when you draw the the the. the it has to be polylines and with the beginning and end that match the beginning and the end of the next lines. Here's the 40 sections imported from the end view so you can see the variation of the width and the depth. And here's an isometric view of the 40 cross sections. So once you import the cross sections into Midas FEA, you have to give it a mesh control which is going to eventually decide the size of your solid uh, element mesh. And you can choose, um, basically this is one of the, the most uh, important decisions that you can make on a, on a final element model because you can have a lot of elements and your model will take a lot of time to run and you can have fewer elements but uh, your accuracy will be not as good. So. Once you create your cross sections, Midas has a feature called uh, lofting, which will create a solid element that uh, spans from two different cross sections. Of course, the cross sections have to have the same number of lines so that it matches, but they don't have to be the same cross section. That's in this case, the cross sections vary in different uh, features like width and depth. Once you create that solid. This solid is just a basic geometry, it doesn't have any properties. Once you create the solid, you also um, have to add a, the mesh that you would like for the subsequent um, uh, solid elements. And from this basic solid, the solid elements are created, and the, the solid elements now have material properties and um, these are finer element elements. Here's a view of uh, the first portion of the bridge. And here's a view of um, the tower where you can see the variation of the depth and the variation of the bottom slab on the left end and to the right end. And you can see the the diaphragm at the tower as well. Since the cross section varies, the, post, the transverse post tension geometry also varied. So we had different um, post tensioning. We had a top a transverse uh, top slab post tensioning, and we had a transverse external post tensioning as well. Once again, since the width of the bridge varied, every tendon was different. So we had 140 different tendons uh, for the top slab and 39 different tendons for, for the uh, drape tendons. So due to this variation, uh, it was easier to develop a spreadsheet with all the geometry points in Excel, then use Excel to create an AutoCAD drawing um, using polylines 
export the polylines from AutoCAD into DXF and once again import, it, import the DXF file into Midas FEA. Here's a view of the, um, the PIs for the top transfer tendon and a little bit of geometry below. There's a lot more numbers below but I couldn't fit it on one screen. Uh, since those PIs, each of them have um, a little bit of a curve, I kind of split the curve into, into quarter points so that the actual geometry of the tendons can be modeled in uh, Midas FEA. So once those points were created in Excel, uh, I, I used a script to uh, import them into AutoCAD. This is just a view of the tendons. Again, you can see the variation to the right. The left side of the bridge was um, a, a, a horizontal line and the right side was the, the, the end that varied. For this is a uh, isometric view of some of the top slab tendons. And uh, once they export into DXF, you can import it into Midas FEA. Also, they're going to be lines. You can draw all this on in Midas FEA, but sometimes it's easier to use a drawing package like AutoCAD or, or MicroStation. Once you import the, the lines into Midas FEA, those lines can be converted into actual post tensioning that will be linked to the solid elements that um, are part of the superstructure. In this case, they have a feature called create reinforcement, which will create a bar, a post tensioning bar in a solid element. And um, you can divide that post tensioning into any num number of different uh, segments. And I think I divided it in by 100. I Once again, the, the same thing happened with the external PT. Uh, this was actually drawn manually because I had to get the end of the line down to the bottom of the web at two sides and then the other end. Once you draw the geometric lines, once again, you can, uh, for the external, you can create line elements which are just post tension uh, elements with the corresponding areas. Uh, there were two different type of tendons. There were also two different type of transfer stop slab tendons. One was four strand and one was two strand depending on where we were along the bridge. We also modeled the, the top cantilever tendons. Once again, you draw the lines as line elements. You cannot see it here, but the line length vary from shorter to longer to model each of the, as, as the balance cantilever keeps growing. Once you draw the lines, you convert them into cantilever PT. Once again, since these are internal tendons, the bar in solid feature is used, and there were three different type of tendons uh, used in this bridge, uh, 27, 23, and 19 strands. And finally, the bottom continuity PT, also drawn as geometric lines first, and then bar and solid. There were two type of tendons, the nine strand at the ends and the 12 strands in the main span. These are just all the lines that had to be drawn for the stays and the post tensioning, uh, longitudinal and transverse. This is a isolation of a typical segment, a typical stay segment, uh, the solid elements and plate elements for the internal diaphragms where the stays are going to be anchoring at either side. And this is a, a, a through view with the two top slab tendons for each segment and the external drape tendon. This is a, 
a through view of the uh, cantilever tendons with one side of the of the uh, segments shown and the other one not. So in the middle you have the tower. The loads, you know, the the loads typically we have um, the dead loads would be self weights. Um, travel loads were modeled as pressure loads. And uh, since these are solid elements, you, you have the capability of doing pressure loads, line loads, point loads, depending on what your requirements are. This just shows um, during a particular construction stage the traveler loads on both sides of the cantilever. The construction sequence was also modeled. Uh, there were a total of 142 steps. And uh, this dead load model ran in about 2.1 hours, which is nothing if we remember the old days. This just shows a little bit of a screenshot of um, how we input the, the staging. We, we, we put the mesh elements that we are activating, the reinforcement, the boundary conditions, and the loads. You can have a activation or deactivations if needed. Here's a quick uh, view of the construction sequence, cer certain steps. Um, it's basically similar to the RM model. Life loads. Uh, the transverse review that we did in, was to make sure that during the erection, everything, all the stresses were below cracking. But we also used this model to do the transverse load rating. And therefore, we did some life load analysis. The life load in Midas FEA, there's a feature called the uh, vehicle truck, which you can put a six axle vehicle, which is going to be an HL, uh, H93 uh, design truck. And you can put it based on a local axis. So if you see in the middle, there's a little crosshair, which is the local axis for this specific cross-section. Um, and the, the actual wheel loads are pressure loads based on a dimension of the wheel, A1 and B1 and so on, and a certain spacing of the wheel, D1 and D2, and a certain transverse spacing of the wheel, S. For, there were seven sections chosen to do the low rating, and one of them was the center, uh, center of the bridge. So for each of those sections, 27 positions of trucks were modeled to account for the way that the truck can be placed anywhere in the transverse direction. This is just a little bit view of how the, the the truck load goes from one end one end of the uh, transverse uh, cross section to the other end. Once you get the results from each of the individual trucks, uh, this shows the seven locations along the main span. Um, some were close to the tower, uh, all the way to the center line center of the span, the main span. Not only the HN93 truck was modeled, but the HN93 uh, tandem truck was also modeled. One of the first things as engineers that we like to do is make sure that the program is working, that your model is working. So uh, I did a quick verification against the existing Iron Bridge single spine model, putting a um, a uniform 10 kilonewtons per meter pressure load on the entire deck. This shows the results of the reactions from RM and FEA. At the end, the total load is the same. There's a little bit of um, variation between the different bearings, and that's basically because the RM is a spine model with outriggers for bearings and 
Midas FEA models is a solid model with bearings underneath a solid diaphragm. At the end, the numbers from uh, one program and the other one match. This is a, a view of the deflection and you can see that it's basically a match. And this is a view of the top fiber stress between RM and Midas FEA. And once again, it's a pretty good match. So this you know, um, gives us confidence that the program is working, the model is working. Uh, some other verifications with it, uh, having a post tensioning element in a solid element was new to us, to me at least, and um, so I did a quick manual verification in which uh, using hand calculations try to calculate the, the top and bottom fiber stresses on the top slab and compare the results with the stresses resulting from the Midas FEA analysis and you can see at the bottom the ratio between the hand and the FEA calculations were fairly close. Another one of the uh, tests was to test the application of a pre-stress pre force on an external tendon. So I applied the pre-stress force that Midas FEA includes in their load library and external forces, yeah, an external tendon can be modeled with external forces at the ends and at the, at the uh, points where it meets the web. Once again, the I compare the stresses between the external, the pre-stress load and the external forces and they matched very well. And finally, I did a quick comparison of the total dead load to make sure that I was including all the dead load in, in the Midas FEA model between the ARM dead loads and the FEA dead loads. And I was between somewhere around 96%. Um, Obviously, there was some weight that now was included at the anchor pier because I, anchor pier was only modeled uh, more simply in the FA model because we were only interested in the superstructure, not in the substructure. So, what results we wanted to get from the Midas FEA? Number one was we wanted to verify the web shear distribution. Um, we did multiple dead load stress checks. And at the end, we did the service stress low rating and the flexural strength low rating. So we needed to get from Midas FEA the dead low stresses, the life low stresses, the dead low moments, and the life load moments. Web shear distribution, you know, when you have two webs, you basically have 50% of the shear distributed to each of the webs. But what happens when you have a multiple cell cross section? How much goes into each web along the length of the bridge? You know, since we have also the state cables, um, and then we have at the ends we have those inclined webs. So that was a challenge that Midas FEA helped us with. Midas FEA has a, a function that's called the local local direction for sum, in which you can cut a plane, and it'll give you the total summation of forces at the center of gravity of that cross-section. So in order to get the specific shears on each web, first for a specific cross-section, calculated the, the total shear by cutting that cross-section with a plane. You can see the, uh, the plane in sort of a greenish and the axis red, yellow, sorry, red, green, and blue. Uh, and at the bottom, you can see the forces, the total summation forces, Fx, Fy, Fz. So once you get the total cross sections here, you can isolate each web and once again do the 
the local direction for some for each of the individual webs. And here we go from the left web inclined, the right inclined web, and then the interior webs. So once I had all the shears for each of those individual components, I used the spreadsheet to calculate the shear distribution for each web along the length of the bridge at different locations, at different and um, it did corroborate our initial transfer design. Next, um, another one of the reasons why we created this model was to verify during the erection that the stresses in the concrete were below tensile. And one of the important parts was at the stay cable segments, uh, especially at the diaphragms. This is uh, a view of the principal stresses, and one of the things that are that, that is uh, interesting to see is the direction of the principal stresses uh, matches the Stratton time model that we did in the original design and the and during the erection to uh, just to uh, look at the the way that the the, the stresses uh, the the stress flow from the stays to the webs. This is just a, a view of the stresses of that uh, state segment diaphragm. Following, which is going to look at different plots of different stresses of different uh, elements. Uh, this is the edge beams. This is a view of the uh, uh, stresses in the longitudinal direction. The uh, one of the things with Midas FEA is is very powerful graphically. And you can isolate any type of element. You can make any type of cuts, and in this case, the stresses are shown at the top of this uh, edge beam by drawing a line from one end to the other one, and just asking for the stresses along that line. This is another view of the uh, edge beam. You can see those hot spots. This is places where the transfer was tensioning anchors. This is a view of the bottom slab. Um, once again, this is just the bottom slab isolated with a portion of the webs. And, and like I said, this program you can um, make any cuts. You can rotate any view, and it was very, very helpful in in uh, just monitoring the stresses. These are just different plots at different stages of the bottom slab, and the variations of the stresses. In this case, uh, these are the transfer st stresses S X X, and um, on this side, it gives you the range, so you can, with one view, you can see where your stresses are. You know what's the range of the stresses, and then the actual plot it shows you the minimum and the maximums. You can you can customize all that. This is some stresses of the top slab um, during the different stages of this is during the segment interaction. This is during the stressing of the top slab transfer PT. This is during the stressing of the stays, and this is towards the end uh, when the side span closures transfer PT is stressed. This is another view of the top slab, but now from the bottom, uh, just showing the hot spots of where the tensile stresses are. Always making sure that they're below. Um, cracking. This is a view of the deflection due to the different truck positions. In this case, it's the K7A, which is at the uh, mid span, and uh, in this case, the truck is placed all the way to the left. This is a view with the truck placed right in the middle, and this is a view with the truck placed all the way to the right. And this is a view of the deflections of the envelope 
of all the trucks going from left to right. And uh, you not only get the envelope of uh, deflections, but most importantly, you get the envelope of stresses that you eventually uh, need to do your low rating. This is some uh, results of the top and uh, bottom fiber stresses due to life load. Again, this is the envelope of all the load placements from left to right for this uh, closure segment, which is right at the mid-span. In order to get the stresses, you, again, you draw a line from one end to the other one, and then you ask for the stresses along that line, and it, it calculates, you know, it knows what elements it's crossing, and it calculates the, the stresses along that line. This is uh, the stresses at the bottom slab. Again, top and bottom fiber of the bottom slab for the same uh, life load envelope. And this is a view of the maximum transfer stresses for all the life load sets, which was seven sections. Uh, so you have seven sections longitudinally, and you have 21 locations transversely. You have the maximum and the minimum stresses, envelopes. And uh, finally, as an engineer, I love to see pictures of construction, so I included some uh, pictures of the construction of the crew bridge. Uh, this is a view uh, while uh, casting one of the segments. You can see the traveler form. You can see the first stay already uh, um, installed. Um, this is a view from the end. Uh, you can see some of the um, uh, holes in the tower where the stays fit through. This is a view of New Haven at the top, New Haven. And you can see the on the right side the existing uh, structure with both the northbound and the southbound traffic. Here's a view closer to um, closure of the main span. Here's a view of the cross section with the reinforcement and towards the uh, one of the ends with the uh, inclined webs and the formwork. This is an interesting view of of one of the segments, uh, again, the inclined web with the formwork and the reinforcement. You can see on the on the top right the cantilever PT. That's an anchor and that's some of the uh, ducts for the next tendons. Here's a view of the reinforcement for the next segment. Here's a view of that diaphragm at the stay segments before being poured, which is the reinforcement. And here's a view afterwards. The, 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 those two holes were something that the contractor asked if we could have, so we had to reanalyze that diaphragm um, because of those two holes. Here's a view of the uh, reinforcement where this cable stay anchors very heavily reinforced. Here's a view of the one of the internal cells with the transverse uh, drape tendons. Um, on the left side, you have an anchor. On the right side, you got a, a deviator. This is a view of the massive diaphragm at the tower. Uh, that's an opening for somebody to walk through, and um, you can walk standing up so that just gives you a perspective of the, how deep this uh, cross-section is. This is a view of the uh, bridge, still not finished. And here's a view of the uh, bridge already finished with the uh, traffic already going through it before the demolition of the existing or the old bridge. And one of the 
reasons why this bridge was, uh, or one of the reasons we saw at the beginning was because of the aesthetics. Uh, this bridge uh, looks very pretty, and since th this was the Pearl Harbor Memorial Bridge, the towers were made in the shape of uh, chimneys of of uh, navy ships. Um, you can see the the roundness of the uh, the towers, and there's a lot of different lighting that has different colors for different type of uh, specific dates. Once again, the Pearl Harbor Memorial Bridge, 